want to welcome you all here this afternoon for the first annual Herbert L. Bernstein Lecture. With this lecture, the Duke Law community celebrates the life of a professor who enriched this school for 17 years until his sudden death at age 71 last year. Professor Bernstein, a specialist in contract, comparative, and private international law, was a man of deep intellectual curiosity, humility, and a powerful commitment to colleagues, students, and family. And I'm very pleased that his widow, Waltrid, is here today, as well as some of his former students and former colleagues. Herbert was born in Hamburg, Germany in 1930 and survived the terrors of World War II as a boy. For a time, he and his mother were forced to live in a converted pigsty as Allied bombing raids annihilated the city. Herbert did more than survive these years. He managed to complete his education and move on to a successful career at the University of Hamburg. He later joined the prestigious Max Planck Institute for Foreign and Private International Law. Today's speaker, Professor Dr. Hein D. Kurtz, president of Bessarius Law School in Hamburg, for a time was a colleague of Professor Bernstein at the Max Planck Institute. Professor Bernstein came to the US in 1962 to study at the University of Michigan where he earned his JD degree magna cum laude. He taught at the University of California at Berkeley, the University of Hamburg, and the University of Southampton in the United King Kingdom before coming to Duke in 1984. His colleagues at Duke Law have noted that Professor Bernstein's experiences through the war seemed to fuel his interests in both history and law and also instilled in, in him a commitment to tolerance, kindness, and justice. It is those qualities, as well as his academic achievements, that we remember through this lecture series. The law school hopes to bring to Duke each year a distinguished comparative or international law scholar to give a public lecture to the law school community in Professor Bernstein's honor. Introducing our inaugural sp speaker today is Professor Ralph Michaels, who this year became a member of the Duke Law faculty he specializes in conflict of laws and comparative law, and he was previously a fellow at the Max Planck Institute where he was a colleague of Professor Kurtz, so he will do the honor of the introduction. Yes, it is all at the three time a pleasure, an honor, and I think very fitting that I I'm actually able here to present Professor Kurtz as the first speaker of the Herbert Memorial, Herbert Bernstein Memorial Lectures. It is first a pleasure for me because I've known Professor Kurtz for, for several years now from the Max Planck Institute, or actually from before when I was in Cambridge as a student. And I am fond of Professor Kurtz. And when I hear him talk, I disagree with much of what he says. But he says what he says in such a charming way that I feel I couldn't properly criticize what he says. You might or might not see for yourselves. Of course, that may be unimportant. The second point is, of course, it is an honor to have Professor Kurtz give a lecture here because of what he is. Professor Kurtz is now the dean of Bucerius Law School, the first private law school in Germany. And if you see it, how slowly legal education actually moves forward in Germany. There has been criticism for 30 years of the public law schools, some people say, but there has been criticism for at least 300 years, as we see when we read Goethe. Um, then having the first private law school is actually something quite spectacular in Germany, at least. Before that, of course, he was a director of the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg for more than 20 years, and he holds numerous positions in the international um, academic community that I will not name all one by one. <laughs> Professor Kutz is the author of one of the most widely read treatises on comparative law, Introduction to Comparative Law, now in its third edition and translated into numerous languages, including English, as my students of last term know from their own experience, of course. And he is one of the preeminent, if not the preeminent, scholar in comparative law in the world. James Gordley himself, not a small figure in comparative law, once said something along the lines, if we all knew as much about comparative law as Professor Kurtz does, uh, then 
the, the field would be really easy. But of course we don't, and that's why we have all those troubles. But um, Hein Kurtz has not only been interested in comparative law, and not only um, in European, Europeanization of contracts law, as we heard yesterday, but he has also always been interested in America. He was a visiting professor in Chicago in 1971, I think. And if I recall the story right, he remembers this interesting young man there running around, Richard Posner, incidentally, <laughs> walking from door to door, asking his colleagues what they were actually doing, and going back to his own office to write down why that was actually efficient, <laughs> and turning that into his um, economic analysis of law. <laughs> and Professor Kurtz got interested in that and was actually one of the first to introduce the economic analysis of law into the German academic field. And as comparatists, we can only wonder about the miracles that might have happened if Richard Posner had only found half as much interest in what Hein Kurtz did and might have introduced some comparative insights into the economic, economic analysis as he does. But most of all, of course, it is extremely fitting to have Professor Kurtz give this first Herbert Bernstein Memorial Lecture because of the connections between Hein Kurtz and Herbert Bernstein. They share a lot of similar traits. They share interests, interests in comparative law, in general contract law, more specifically civil procedure, the topic of today's talk, and a curiosity for everything new and strange that is so important for comparative law. They also share many similar strands in their lives. They both come from Hamburg. They actually met at the Max Planck Institute there. And they met again later in um, Michigan, I think, where Professor Bernstein was working, reworking the work of another eminent German scholar, Ernst Rabel, on the conflict of laws. And Hein Kurtz was one of the first German LLMs to go to the United States. And they actually became friends. So for more than 40 years, they have said do to each other. Now, saying do to each other doesn't mean anything, of course, to an American audience if it doesn't speak German. There is the formal Z and the much less formal do. And that's closely like calling someone else by their first name. But of course, again, a country that even refers to its president as W <laughs> does not have that kind of distinction. Let me assure you that in Hamburg, until not too long ago, even children would not have said do to their parents. So that is a rare thing indeed. So altogether, this is a pleasure, it is an honor, and I think it is altogether very fitting that Professor Kurtz should give this first memorial lecture on civil justice in Europe and the United States. And please welcome him together with me. Thank you very much for this very uh, generous uh, introduction. Uh, it reminded me of a story I was told about Henry Kissinger. Uh, he had to give a talk uh, at the German embassy in Washington, D.C., uh, and the German ambassador uh, introduced him, saying, uh, there is uh, no man needs an introduction less than Henry Kissinger. And then he proceeded to provide an introduction that took half an hour or so. And then it was Henry Kissinger's turn. And he said, uh, it is true that no man needs an int introduction less than I do, but it's also true that nobody enjoys it more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me first to say uh, what an honor it is to be invited to present Duke's first Herbert Bernstein Memorial Lecture. Herbert's death uh, a little more than a year ago was a great shock not only to the Duke Law School community, but also to the friends he had in Germany. I knew Herbert for nearly 40 years, even more than 40 years, and I'm very grateful indeed uh, for this opportunity to pay tribute to him and to his contribution uh, to law and legal education. When Dean Bartlett agreed to the topic of my lecture, she must have realized that letting a foreign lawyer touch upon American civil procedure would be a hazardous affair. Not only is a foreign lawyer who ventures into this field 
bound sooner or later to fall into error, but he will expect you to forgive him and kindly put him right when he does so. Not only is he apt to rush in where local angels fear to tread, but courtesy may require you to call his views original and refreshing when they are heretical or bizarre. There is one countervailing argument supporting the choice of my subject, and that is that it was very dear to Herbert's heart. He and I discussed it on many occasions, and while we both felt that comparing the machinery of civil justice in the common law and in the civil law was a most challenging and interesting undertaking, we also agreed that it was a subject fraught with greater risks of fundamental misunderstanding uh, than those which, th than that risk which beset the comparative endeavors in substantive law. Our shared interest in the comparison of civil justice systems goes back to the early 1960s when both Herbert and I were graduate students at the University of Michigan Law School. All graduate students with a, with a U European law background were given an introductory course on American law and procedure was an important subject of this course, and adversariness was held up to us as the hallmark of the American procedural system. The introductory course itself followed the adversary model in that we were asked to read Roscoe Pound's celebrated article on the causes of popular dissatisfaction with the administ administration of justice, with its sharp attack on the excesses of the adversary system. We were told that Jerome Frank had described the American mode of trials as being based on what he called the fight theory, a theory which in his view derives from the origin of trials as substitutes for private out-of-court brawls and frequently blocks the uncovering of vital evidence or leads to a presentation of vital testimony in a way that distorts it. At the time, however, this had no great impact on us. We were enthralled to watch lawyer-dominated civil and criminal trials at the Ann Arbor Circuit Court on closed-circuit television in a viewing room at the law school. We also enjoyed the moot court cases with their colorful and dramatic confrontation between partisan student advocates and any lingering doubts about the attraction of adversariness were dispelled by reading Earl Stanley Gardler, Raymond Chandler, and Robert Traver's novel entitled Anatomy of a Murder, a very popular novel at the time. For those of us who remained in contact with American law, however, a gradual process of disenchantment set in. Like most readers of Robert Traver's novel, we were delighted of the defendant's acquittal on the basis of a successful plea of impaired mental capacity. But the not guilty verdict was based on facts supplied by the defendant only after his lawyer had impressed on him what type of fact would constitute that defense. Can it be right to allow or even require a lawyer to arm his client for effective perjury? There were other questions we asked. It is all very well to say that cross-examination is, in the words of John Wigmore, the greatest legal engine ever invented for the discovery of truth, and that it is a most effective weapon to test dishonest witnesses. But isn't it a weapon equally lethal to heroes and villains? There is no doubt that all procedural systems aim at an intelligent inquiry into all the practically available evidence in order to ascertain, as near as may be, the truth about the facts. But suppose a businessman where to decide whether or not to build a new plant. Would he think of obtaining the needed information by subjecting his informants to the experience of standing as a witness at a common law trial? Is there no more business-like method to unearth the relevant facts? 
It is indeed a routine business meeting an American lawyer will believe he is attending when he is led into a European courtroom. What is most likely to strike him is the fact that the interrogation of witnesses is conducted mainly by the court. It is the court who will ask the witness for the name, age, occupation, and residence. It is the court who will then invite the witness to narrate without undue interruption what he knows about the matter on which he has been called. After the witness has given his story in his or her own words, the court will ask questions designed to test, clarify, and amplify it. It is then, only then, counsels and the parties turn to formulate pertinent questions. But in an ordinary case, there is relatively little questioning by counsel or the parties, at least by common law standards. One reason is that the judge will normally have covered the ground, and another reason is for counsel to examine at length after the court has seemingly exhausted the witness might appear to imply that, that the court doesn't know uh, its business, and that is a dubious tactic. There is no cross-examination in the sense of the common law, nor is there a full stenographic transcript of the testimony. Instead, the judge himself pauses from time to time to dictate a summary of what the witness has said so far. At the close of the testimony, the clerk will read back the dictated summary in full, and either witness or counsel may suggest improvements in the wording. If the exact phrasing of a particular part of the testimony is believed to be of critical importance, counsel may insist on having it set down verbatim in the minutes. A similar system is used with respect to expert witnesses. Suppose there is a case where an expert's evidence is required, for, exam for example, in an action for damages brought by a patient against his physician on the ground of the defendant's failure to use ordinary care in his treatment. In Germany, as indeed in most, if not all, continental countries, the expert will be selected and appointed by the court after consultation with the parties. It is the court that will conduct his or her examination, and it is the court that will advance the expert's fees eventually to be borne by the losing party. In the common law, it is up to the parties, or rather their lawyers, to find suitable experts who will then be examined and cross-examined in the same way as ordinary witnesses. I have served both as a court-appointed expert on foreign law in cases pending before a German court and as a party-selected expert witness on German law in litigation before the High Court in London. And I assure you that, the, uh, that there are significant differences in the two roles. As a court-appointed expert, you are an ally and partner of the court. You assist the court to the best of your ability in reaching a correct result. And it is with the court that your duty of loyalty lies. What struck me most in my role as party-selected expert witness in the English cases was, to some extent, the experience of being grilled for hours uh, on that point of German law, which was relevant. But what struck me even more was uh, the difficulty to resist the subtle temptation to join your client's team to take your client's side, to conceal doubts, to overstate the strong and downplay the weak aspects of his case, and to dampen any scruples you might have by reminding yourself that the other side will select and instruct another expert witness, and that when the dust has settled, the truth will emerge triumphant. The examination of witnesses in the continental style may not be free from certain risks. One might say, for example, that the technique of inviting the witness to tell his story in narrative form and without undue interruption provides an incentive in the interest of presenting a conclusive, logically coherent, and convincing story to fill in gaps by half-truths or fiction. There is also a danger that the judge in acting as the chief examiner of the witnesses, 
may sooner or later appear to favor one side over the other, and that by putting questions to the witness, he may appear, uh, in the words of, Lon uh, of Lord Denning, to drop the mantle of the judge and assume the robe of an advocate. In general, however, a competent judge in questioning witnesses knows how to play his cards close to his chest. If he pursued one line of questioning with undue vigor or in some other way revealed his evaluation of the testimony, this would at any rate have no influence on a jury since there are no civil juries on the continent as we shall see uh, later. As to counsel, they may ask follow-up questions as an antidote against unfair or incompetent questioning by the judge. On the other hand, under the continental system, there is no need, as in common law jurisdictions, to prepare the prospective witness for counsel's questions during the examination in chief and cross-examination. Consequently, the coaching or sandpapering of witnesses is not a problem. Indeed, German lawyers will generally be reluctant to engage in extensive out-of-court contact with prospective witnesses. A canon of professional ethics promulgated by the German Bar Association in 1973 provided that out-of-court contact with witnesses was advisable only when special circumstances justified it and was at any rate limited to clarifying what the witness would be able to say. This rule was dropped when new provisions on professional ethics were enacted in 1996, probably because there seemed no need for it. After all, it is fairly clear to an attorney that the judge would take a dim view of the reliability of a witness who previously had been closeted for long periods with counsel. Civil procedure in Germany and in other civil law jurisdictions differs from the American system by making the judge responsible for the selection of expert witnesses, for the examination in chief of both fact and expert witnesses, and for creating the record based on those examinations. The judge's conspicuous role in the actual taking of evidence, especially in the taking of witness testimony, has led common lawyers, some common lawyers, to label continental civil procedure as inquisitorial. This is misleading because it conjures up the Spanish Inquisition, Kafka's castle, and bureaucratic <coughs> omnipotence, and has in indeed led an English judge to say, in comparing English and continental procedure, that, I quote, our national experience found that justice is more likely to ensue from adversary than from inquisitorial procedures. Inquisition and star chamber were decisive, and knowledge of recent totalitarian methods has merely rammed the lesson home. In my view, however, this is not only misleading, but downright wrong. All arguments generally praising the virtues of the adversarial system of the common law and contrasting them with the vices of the inquisitorial system ascribed to the civil law are misguided and, in Herbert's words, I quote, cannot advance, even by an inch, the comparative analysis of German and American civil procedure. The truth is that both in the American and continental civil justice systems, the power to establish the facts on which the judicial decision rests is reserved to the decision makers, be it the trial judge or jury in America or the court on the continent. On the other hand, it is in both systems exclusively for the parties and their lawyers to identify the facts they think will support the claim or defense to make the appropriate factual allegations and to nominate the witnesses and the facts of which they allegedly have knowledge. In America, just as on the continent, the civil courts must work with what they are given and they must establish the factual basis of their judgments from the materials the parties supply and no others. Facts not in dispute between the parties are beyond judicial scrutiny nor can the judge do anything about a fact alleged by one party and not specifically challenged by the opponent. 
he must take that fact as established, and if he believes that the facts presented by the parties are not true, he has no power to unearth what he thinks might be the truth by introducing independent evidence. True, this does not apply to criminal procedure. In a criminal case, the continental judge may disregard the defendant's guilty plea or a confession or an admission and introduce independent evidence, including witness testimony, to determine what is called the material truth. In civil matters, however, the principle of formal truth applies. And formal truth is what the court, to the best of its ability, believes to be true, having regard to the evidence placed before it by the parties. The court's task is to do, and be seen to be doing, justice between the parties. It is not to ascertain some independent truth. It often happens from the imperfection of evidence or the withholding of it, sometimes by the party in whose favor it would tell if presented, that an adjudication has to be made which is not and is known not to be the whole truth of the matter. Yet, provided the decision has been in accordance with the available evidence and with the law, justice will have been fairly done. It follows that in their own ways, both the German and American systems are adversary systems of civil procedure. In both systems, the lawyers advance partisan positions from first pleadings to final arguments. In both systems, the parties and their lawyers investigate and identify in their briefs the facts they will think they think will support their claims and defenses. In both systems, the court cannot go beyond the party's factual contentions, nor can the court strike out on his own in the search for what it believes might be the real truth. To be sure, there exist quite a few features in German civil procedure which are in marked contrast to American practices. First, there is the judge's prominent role in the actual taking of witness testimony. This should not be overrated, I think, because the judge, even though he serves as the examiner-in-chief of the witnesses, is prohibited from inducing them to testify on facts other than those for which they were named. Another characteristic of German and indeed continental civil procedure is that no party is allowed to bring before the court as many witnesses as he pleases. There is no rule requiring all of plaintiff's witnesses to be heard before the defendant's witnesses, nor is there a compulsion to take proof on all the apparently contested issues at one sitting or to call first the witnesses nominated by the party carrying the burden of proof. What the parties can do and will do is nominate witnesses in support of specific factual allegations, and it is then for the court to make an evidentiary order identifying the witnesses to be heard, describing with some precision the facts on which each witness is to be examined, and fixing the order in which they are to be called. In making this evidentiary order, the court will consult with the parties, and uh, they will direct the court's attention to particularly cogent lines of inquiry. However, the final decision rests with the court, whose discretion will be guided by a strict standard of relevancy, as well as by the principle that evidence is to be taken only to the extent and in the order most likely to result in a speedy disposal of the case. If, for example, witnesses have been nominated for a factual contention which the judge believes on legal grounds to be immaterial to the party's claim or defense, he will not allow the witness to be called. Nor will he order the examination of a witness in support of a factual allegation which the judge finds is not really in dispute between the parties or has not been specifically challenged by the opposition. If the court perceives that there is a matter which is likely to be determinative, it may confine the evidentiary order to that matter and await the results before issuing a further evidentiary order. Suppose that in a seller's action for the price, the buyer's defense is, first, 
that no contract was formed, second, that the goods delivered were defective, and third, that in any event the seller's claim is barred by the statute of limitations. In this situation, it is within the judge's discretion to select the defense most likely to lead to a dismissal of the action and to postpone consideration of the other defenses. He may then make an evidentiary order focusing strictly on that defense which the judge thinks is most likely to lead to a speedy uh, disposal of the case. In a brilliant, if controversial, article by uh, John Langbein, uh, he characterized the German procedural system as one in which the gathering of the facts was entrusted to and controlled by the judge. In his view, judicially dominated fact gathering is the hallmark of the German system and constitutes the major German advantage, as he called it, as compared with the system prevailing in the US. I am not sure whether it is wholly appropriate to describe the court's job as that of gathering the facts. After all, it is the parties and their lawyers who will investigate the facts, discuss them with their clients, select what will be presented to the court, indicate means of proof, and thus gather the factual materials with which the court must work. This is why the German procedural system is an adversarial system. However, once the parties have supplied the factual materials and the time has come to investigate the truth of the parties' allegations, evaluate the evidence, and find the facts on which the decision is to be based, the German judge has a fairly strong control over the procedure. He may disregard proof offers which, according to strict criteria of relevance, might safely be overlooked. Nor are there any binding rules on sequence, such as plaintiff's case before defendant's case. Instead, the judge is encouraged to range over the entire case and concentrate the inquiry on those issues most likely to result in an expeditious disposal of the matter. While the court can only call witnesses nominated by the parties, it does exercise a discretion as to the order and number of the witnesses and plays a vigorous role in acting as the examiner-in-chief of the witnesses. John Langbein's attack on American civil procedure and his praise for the German counterpart have stirred up a lively debate in this country. Some critics accept that strengthening the court's role in the evidentiary process would save time and money, reduce the wastefulness and complexity of pre-trial and trial procedure, and cut down on the distortions inherent in the system of partisan preparation and production of witnesses and experts. They argue, nevertheless, that such a move would be incompatible with the traditional roles of lawyers and judges in this country and fly in the face of significant and ineradicable features of American legal culture. On the one hand, John Langbein has rightly admonished us not, I quote, to allow the cry of cultural differences to become the universal apologetic that permanently sheathes the status quo against criticism based upon comparative example. On the other hand, cultural differences do, in my view, explain uh, uh, something of why institutional and procedural differences arise in different legal systems and why transplanting legal institutions from one society to another may be more difficult in one case than in, the, than in another. The important question is what weight to attach to this factor for the present purpose. John Langbein's answer is not much. But this is surely a point on which reasonable people may differ. The possibility of transplanting legal institutions is indeed one of the most controversial topics of comparative law. It is also a topic much ventilated these days in Europe. We are currently embarking in Europe on a process of unifying the contract law or the law of obligations of the member states of the European Union. <coughs> Although work on a uniform code of contract law or a uniform code on the law of obligations has not yet received the official blessing 
of the European Union Commission, the academic debate on what is surely the largest current comparative law enterprise in Europe is intense. In this debate, a small but articulate minority holds the view that each of the European nations is the product of a unique legal, political, and social history, and that their social and political values and goals are so different that the unification of law in Europe, like the merger of the French, English, and German languages, is a barren and pointless exercise and indeed a chimera, I think you pronounce it, a chimera. I do not share this view. There is today what Oliver Holmes might have called a far-reaching free trade in legal ideas in all that relates to economic activity, trade and transport, banking and insurance. In these fields, the possibility of transplanting legal institutions and indeed of unifying the law should not be ruled out at the start because of supposed cross-cultural differences. However, we are concerned here not with business-related fields of substantive law, but with procedure. And there is much to be said for the view that all rules organizing constitutional, legislative, administrative, or judicial procedures are deeply rooted in a country's peculiar features of history, social structure, and political consensus, and as such are more resistant to transplantation. Procedural law is tough law, said Otto Kahn Freund, since all that concerns the legal, the, the technique of legal practice is likely to resist change, he concluded that, I quote, comparative law has far greater utility in substantive law than in the law of procedure, and the attempt to use foreign models for judicial organization and procedure may lead to frustration and may thus be a misuse of the comparative method. Must we accept this as the last word on the matter? Another distinguished comparative lawyer and proceduralist, Arthur von Mehren, Harvard Law School, reached a different conclusion. While not challenging, challenging the view that a procedural system's general structure and principal features express society's social and political values and goals, he nevertheless said that, I quote, very real differences between first instance procedural arrangements in the United States on the one hand and in France and Germany on the other derive much less from differences in social or political values or in institutional, sociological or psychological assumptions than from the institutional fact of the concentrated or discontinuous nature of the trial. Indeed, one salient characteristic of European civil procedure lies in the fact that it is wholly unfamiliar with and knows nothing of the idea of a trial as a single temporally continuous presentation in which all materials are made available to the adjudicator. Instead, proceedings in a civil action on the continent may, may be described as a series of isolated conferences before the judge, some of which may last only for a few minutes, in which written communications between the parties are exchanged and discussed, procedural rulings are made, evidence is introduced, and testimony taken until the case is finally ripe for adjudication. Procedure in the common law jurisdictions, on the other hand, has been deeply influenced by the institution of the jury. Since a jury cannot be convened, dismissed, and recalled from time to time over an extended period, the common law trial must be staged as a concentrated courtroom drama, a continuous show running steadily once begun towards its conclusion. This in turn entails that there must be a separate pre-trial process for the parties enabling them not only to gather the evidence that they may need at trial, but also to prevent surprise by informing them of the details of all positions the opponent may advance when the controversy is ultimately presented to the court. This solution requires elaborate pre-trial 
interrogatory and discovery procedures because once the trial commences, there is no opportunity to go back, search for further information, and present it to the court at some later date. Clearly, elaborate pre-trial probing of the arguments of fact and law on which the other party proposes to rely provides a solution to the surprise problem. However, this solution is not without its cost. First, it is intrinsically duplicative. Witnesses are prepared, examined and cross-examined during pre-trial, then prepared, examined and cross-examined again at trial. Since the judge, uh, excuse me, second, uh, it, this uh, uh, procedure tends to be overbroad. Only rarely can a litigator tell at the beginning precisely what issues and what facts will prove important in the end. Since the judge customarily has little contact with pretrial investigation, he has no opportunity to signal what information he thinks relevant to the decision. As a result, the litigators must strain to investigate and analyze everything that could possibly arise at trial. They tend to leave no stone unturned, provided, of course, that they can charge their fees by the stone. Because of their active role in the pre-trial phase, the lawyers typically have a greater understanding of the case than does the judge when the controversy is ultimately presented at the trial. It follows that the lawyers run the show at trial, that they frame the issues, that they question the witnesses and stage and present even uncontroverted facts as if in a drama. Since the judge comes to the trial with little more understanding of the controversy than he can have from the complaint and other documents filed with the court, he is hardly in a position to act as the examiner-in-chief of the witnesses and to confine the scope of the evidentiary process to those avenues of inquiry he thinks are relevant or most likely to resolve the dispute. It would seem, therefore, that the institution of the jury is the cause of the strict segmentation of American procedure into pre-trial and trial compartments, and that this, that this segmentation, in turn, is the cause for the waste and duplication of lawyer-dominated pre-trial discovery procedures. Strengthening the court's control over the evidentiary process would then be practicable only if America followed the example of most, if not all, major common law jurisdictions and abolished the civil jury. In England, trial by jury has almost disappeared from civil litigation, except where a person's reputation is at stake, for example, where he sues for libel. And the civil jury has also, also withered to insignificance in Canada and Australia, not because of dissatisfaction with its results, but because of the costs and inefficiencies imposed by it on the civil litigation process. Clearly, abandoning the civil jury or restricting its availability would be a most controversial matter in America. Not only is the right to trial by jury enshrined in the Seventh Amendment and in comparable state constitutional guarantees, there is also a substantial body of opinion that both the criminal and the civil jury are worthwhile bulwarks against biased, eccentric, or incompetent trial judges and enable the public to take an active part in the administration of both civil and criminal justice. I do not think, however, that the civil jury is the only or even major villain of the peace. True, it is because of the jury that the trial must be carried out as a single episode courtroom drama, and it is because of the trial as a concentrated event that pre-trial discovery procedures are needed to handle the surprise problem. But it seems to me that discovery in the form practiced today in America goes far beyond the mere uh, prevention of courtroom ambush. Rather, discovery allows a party to search and indeed fish for information in opponents' and non-parties' hands under a very liberal standard of relevancy, requiring only that the search be reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. 
it has been said that it is possible and by no means rare in the U.S. For a, for a plaintiff to bring a lawsuit in order to discover whether he might actually have one. Aggressive discovery in the American style is unknown not only in continental procedure, but in English procedure as well. Of course, all procedural systems must balance the importance of truth for the fact-finding process against the need to protect areas of business and personal privacy from unreasonable invasion. But not all systems will strike the same balance between the two goals. And it is evident that the bread of American discovery rules comes down more heavily on the side of privacy in civil litigation. Judge Rifkin had a point when he said that, I quote, a foreigner watching the discovery proceedings in a civil suit would never suspect that this country has a highly prized tradition of privacy enshrined in the Fourth Amendment. Nonetheless, I think an argument can be made for American discovery methods despite the excesses to which they are prone. Consider the type of case in which full-dress discovery proceedings will normally take place. In many of those cases, the lawsuit is not only a dispute between private individuals about private rights, but also a grievance about the operation of public policy or the vindication of the public interest. In his famous book on democracy in America, Alexis de Tocqueville noted that, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this famous quotation, that scarcely any political question arises in the United States that is not resolved sooner or later into a judicial question. This observation seems to have lost none of its pertinence today. If a European lawyer looks at the contemporary legal scene in America, he is impressed by the extent to which court litigation, rather than legislation or administrative action, is used as a means to cure defects in the structures and practices of important social institutions. Class actions are a good case in point. By allowing plaintiffs to sue for the aggregated damages suffered by many other similarly situated individuals, the class action provides an effective means of vindicating the rights of people uh, uh, who individually would not have the strength to bring their opponents into court. In this sense, class action plaintiffs may be viewed as private attorneys general advancing and protecting substantial public interests. Treble damages actions under Section 4 of the Clayton Act have been described by the Supreme Court as, I quote, a vital means of enforcing the antitrust policy of the United States. And a treble damages action is, of course, brought by a private individual. It is not the SEC, but the shareholders' derivative suit, which the Supreme Court regarded as the chief regulator of corporate management. What surprises the European observer about American product liability litigation is not the preconditions for liability, which are just as strict in Europe as in the, in, in the US. What he does find astonishing is the stupendous volume of litigation, the size of awards made to successful claimants, and the fact that it is not uncommon for many thousands of claims to be bundled together and dealt with in a single trial. All developed legal systems must ensure the safety of products in the interest of the consumer. It would seem, however, that Americans, with their traditional mistrust of governmental authority, rely not so much on the initiative of administrators or public prosecutors, but rather on private litigation as the chief regulator of corporate action in the product safety field. If this analysis is correct, a strong case can be made out for the view that to the extent to which private litigation serves the vindication of a public interest, the parties must be equipped with robust discovery procedures to ferret out the truth even at the expense of business or personal privacy. Nor would it seem plausible to put the discovery tools in the hands of judges or parajudicial officials if only because discovery conducted by a judge or magistrate would not be as thorough as discovery conducted by the party's lawyers. 
civil litigation as a means of vindicating the public interest is by far less significant in Europe. Class actions for the recovery of damages suffered by hundreds or thousands of persons are unknown on the continent. Derivative suits by shareholders, product liability cases, and actions based on a violation of the antitrust law are not unusual, but have nowhere attained the dimension, vigor, and force that would qualify them as significant checks on corporate behavior. It is much harder to argue the case for the American civil justice system where it deals with cases in which the lawsuit is merely a dispute between private individuals about private rights, as for example in an ordinary personal injury action. True, 97 or 98 percent of all civil matters in the United States do not result in a jury trial but are resolved by settlement. However, uh, uh, in both systems, well, that is true also in Germany. Only a tiny ma majority of civil uh, actions will uh, be decided uh, by the court. The majority of those uh, actions will be resolved by settlement. However, in both systems, the parties are bargaining in the shadow of the law, and the law is very different indeed. In the U.S., due to the cost and number of attorney hours spent on investigating the case and on pretrial motions, discovery, and trial, the economic pressure to settle is intense. Moreover, the outcome of an American jury trial is less predictable than that of a case tried to a German professional judge. Let me illustrate this by looking at one important area of the law in which the differences are indeed striking, that is, in the law relating to the assessment of damages for personal injuries. Legal doctrine in Germany and America does not differ greatly in most such cases. Far more significant are differences in the mode of trial. Because these cases are tried by a judge alone in Germany, and damages are assessed by judges with full and detailed reasons given, the calculation of damages has become much more regularized, systematic, and uniform in Germany, while the range of awards in similar cases is very much larger in the American system of trial, almost entirely as a result of the use of juries. Accordingly, the probable range of damages is less predictable in the US than in Germany. <coughs> Unpredictability leads to uncertainty, and uncertainty increases the importance of good legal representation, which may be easily available to repeat players like insurance companies, but raises concerns about access to justice for the poor and procedural equality of litigants with disparate, disparate economic resources. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that what is often overlooked in the literature on comparative civil procedure is that different procedural systems may focus on different categories of case and that the typical case the German system is aiming at is a case involving a comparatively small amount of money which raises no major issue of public policy and is merely a dispute between private parties about private rights. In such cases, it obviously makes sense to give the judge a leading role in the examination of witnesses and wider powers over the evidentiary process thereby reducing considerably the amount of lawyer effort and cost in exchange for a modest increase in effort and activity on the part of the judge. This is where I think the advantages and the strength of the European procedural systems lie. If there is a desire to reform American civil procedure so as to provide effective justice for the little guy, either by making changes within the traditional system or by developing alternative methods of dispute resolution, then the continental experience may well be a worthwhile object of study. Thank you very much. <laughs>